Uh, I have kind of a daunting task ahead of me today. Uh, I have to speak to you about the entire book of Exodus, not just one chapter, and how we approach the study of this foundational book. And um, I thought that having an extra 10 days to prepare would be a good thing, that it would help me to you know, explore every avenue and think uh, in terms of, of every possibility, and um, indeed it did, and the more I thought, the more things popped into my mind, and I realized that I uh, could muse on and on and on, and even though y'all are enjoying being here in the light and the air conditioning, you would get tired eventually <laughs> of hearing me ramble, and the one thing that I know that all of you have a lot of right now is rotten fruit and vegetables, so I know that you'll start to throw them at me if I go too long, so I'll keep my watch here and I will try to keep uh, my musings to kind of a, a, a shortened version of all of the things that I thought of about Exodus in the last 10 days. And again, as I said, there's so much here, it's very difficult not to think on and on about it. Um, you know, we talked last week just briefly, and of course it was in our commentary this week, about the four senses of how we study scripture um, there's the literal sense, which is just that written word on the page, that historical event, um, you know, that is one way of studying it. The other three ways of studying scriptures, those other three senses, all have to do with a deeper meaning in a spiritual sense. And Exodus is just full of that. This is a pivotal moment, a pivotal book in Judeo-Christian tradition for the Jewish, our Jewish brothers and sisters, as well as for us. So there are so many layers of meaning, and we learned you know, this week in the commentary that those spiritual levels are, you know, first that allegorical, the symbolic, and I'm going to talk a lot about that, about the symbolism that's present in that book and how it speaks um, to us today. Um, we learn a lot about our moral life, how to act justly, um, how we are to live. We learn very quickly as we watch the Israelites in the desert um, that we should not grumble that we should be grateful. And we've kind of found through this experience with Hurricane Ike how difficult that can be. Um, we've learned that we should be faithful, that we should trust in God. We know also how difficult that can be sometimes. We take our eyes away from him leading us and look elsewhere. And lastly, we learn to be patient in our moral life. I'm sure when they walked out of Egypt, they didn't think that it would be 40 years later before they walked into Canaan. They thought it would be much quicker than that. So we learned to be patient. Um, finally, the last sense in which we study this book is an anagogical of, of future things has it having to do with um, the kingdom of heaven, the final beatific vision. And that, that is so clear in the symbolism of, of Exodus as they journey through the desert into that promised land. Um, so again, I said that I would uh, kind of try to gear it down, so I made an outline of three things that I wanted to talk about about the book of Exodus. Um, the first one being Exodus as a journey, the second being Exodus as liturgy, and the third being Exodus as a metaphor of our own life of passing from bondage into freedom and from death into life. So I did, on all three things, the first thing that I thought to do was to go to the dictionary. I, I love going to the dictionary and reading the definition of different words. I don't know why, but I do. So the first word that I came to was Exodus as journey. So I looked up what the word journey meant, and it basically said that a journey is travel or passage from one place to another. Well, okay. I understand that, that makes sense, but it just didn't seem deep enough because we travel from one place to another all day long and every day. We leave our home, we go to church, we go to the grocery store, we run endless errands of taking the kids to school and back home again. I guess it is a journey in a way, but it just didn't seem to epitomize what to me was a journey. So I went back to my own childhood, what to me epitomized a journey. And I am the youngest of three children. My brothers are seven and 10 years older than I am. Um, so as my parents got older, I was the only one still at home and they wanted to travel more. Um, the only problem was my mother was deathly afraid to fly. 
she just wouldn't do it. And because they wanted to take long, extensive trips across country, uh, what became their chosen mode of travel, and I got to participate in three of these treks across country, and it was just an amazing experience for me, what became their chosen mode of travel was by train. And before you visualize Woody Guthrie with a backpack jumping on a freight train, it was a little different from that back in the 60s. Um, this was at the end of an era of luxury train travel, if any of you ever had the opportunity to participate in that. So I took three amazing trips all the way across the United States, all the way across Canada, and then all the way across Mexico um, with my parents with this experience of luxury train travel at that time. So it was a world where there were white linen tablecloths in the dining car, crystal and silverware, where there were sleeping berths that you know you stayed in. If you've ever watched some of the old 1940s movies, you see they depict it so well, and I can visualize and remember every bit of that. Um, there were club cars where people would sit at tables facing each other, and they would play dominoes, they would play cards all day long as the train traveled across the country. And the most amazing car of all, which I will never forget, was the observation deck. You would climb up a little stairway up to the top and you would sit in, in rows of seats and it was like kind of like the opposite of a glass bottom boat. It was completely glass on the top of the observation car. So as you traveled from the plains to the mountains and then all the way to the western sea coast, you got to see that amazing landscape pass you by and you got to really feel that you were journeying and you were traveling. I, I can still remember sitting in those observation cars and watching a landscape pass a spy. I've traveled to California several times since then, but I haven't had that same sense of journey at all. It's not the same when you go to Intercontinental and you get on a plane and watch a movie and then show up in, in LA. It's completely different than what I experienced when I was six. Um, but the other thing that I loved about train travel is it was a journey within a journey. It wasn't just us getting from one place to another. It wasn't just Kansas City to LA. It wasn't just Toronto to Vancouver. It wasn't that at all. It was like a journey within a journey because as you went from place to place within the car and you traveled through all those different um, cars, you kind of felt like you were entering different places as you went. You know, if you traveled by the sleeping cars, they took up a lot of the room, so if someone came facing you, you know, you had to turn sideways and scoot by to let them by. It wasn't a wide uh, pathway, it was very narrow, so that was the only way to get through. Of course, as you traveled through the club cars and the dining cars, you know, you witnessed people being sociable, visiting with each other, but when you got to the observation deck, you witnessed almost a sense of awe. People would speak in whispers. People didn't visit quite the way they did in the club cars because they were just in awe of that beautiful scenery passing by. Well, the other thing that you have to know about traveling across the train is just like when your, your children were little and you bought them those little Brio trains and they had to hook together in some way. Well, all those fancy cars had to hook together some way too. Um, and when you would travel from car to car, there was a point where you actually had to leave the safety of a car and go outside. They made it as safe as, it, as they possibly could. They had put a little walkway over the connector. But regardless, for one split second of time, you were outside and you could see the tracks rushing by. You could feel the wind. You could kind of feel that sense of danger and fear as you passed from the safety of one car to the next car, and it was just a very dramatic thing, especially as I was very young. As I got to be a teenager, I was used to it, not as frightening. I will say the first trip I took was with my brothers, so that element of fear probably had something to do with them. <laughs> them trying to escort me from car to car, but it was, it was very dramatic, because you really felt like you were on a train at that point, because you could feel the shaking and you could see the, the tracks rush by. It was completely different than being in the safety of the observation car. Well, Exodus is a journey, and what we read in this book is just a small piece of it. This isn't the entire journey. We learned in our commentary and last week when Jeff was speaking that really their journey started a long time ago. 
I don't know if any of y'all had, had the chance over the 10 days to go back and read all the uh, chapters in Exodus, or I'm sorry, in Genesis that he referred to. But this journey began a long time ago. The journey began um, with Abraham. The journey began with his beloved son that he passed that covenant and promise to, to Isaac. And then that fascinating story of how the covenant was passed, not to Isaac's oldest son, technically, by just a few moments, but not to his oldest son, but to Jacob instead. God had a plan all the way through, and that covenant was passed through Jacob. And then through Jacob to his beloved son, the story that we well know, um, Joseph, that firstborn son of Rachel. Not his firstborn either, not the one that we would think it would pass through, but again, God had a plan. And all the way through, these firstborn sons of Israel were called beloved. We see when we come to the Gospel of, of Mark at the baptism of Jesus, um, it is God that calls Jesus his beloved son because now the covenant and the promise will pass through him. So that fulfillment comes at that point. But these beloved sons, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it's because of Joseph now that the Israelite people find themselves in Egypt because Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. Um, he became, through a series of, of events, he became governor actually of Egypt and was in a position to, in a time of famine, welcome his family back in and sustain them and feed them. And they moved into Egypt, settled in the land of Goshen. And of course, that's where we find them at the beginning of Exodus. So their story began and their journey began a long time ago. It isn't just the wandering in the desert. And when we get to the end of the book of Exodus, as we see them at Mount Sinai, well, we know their journey isn't over at that point either. We're just looking at a small piece. You'd have to go ahead and read all the way through Leviticus and Numbers until you saw them actually pass into the promised land of Canaan. So it's still a long trek and a long journey. And again, we are just looking at a piece of it. We often think of you know, the journey itself as the wandering in the desert because that's what we are so familiar with. And of course, we've had the, um, the opportunity to be witness to Cecil B. DeMille's depiction of this book. And it's hard not to go back to that in our mind and think, that this is what it was like. But again, this is only, only a piece, only a small part of it. Um, but it's not just that dictionary definition of a journey being from one place to another. We could say that the journey was from Egypt to Canaan. We could say that, and it would have an element of truth to it. But we know that the truth is that their journey was not, not just that, but from the forced labor and the slavery they found themselves in, in Egypt, to the emergence of them as a people, as a great nation, and a nation that would stand out in history because of their covenant relationship with the one true God. Their story that is told again and again, not only in this book of Exodus, but in our liturgies as well, um, is not only their story, but it's our story as well. And that brings me to my next point, which is Exodus as liturgy. Once again, I went to my dictionary and I looked up what is, um, what is liturgy? What is the definition of it? And it says in my, my Webster's dictionary, it says that liturgy is a rite or a body of rites prescribed for public worship. Well, we know, the, we know that definition, but the other definition that we as Catholics know is that liturgy is the work of the people. It isn't one person. It isn't even one section of the church. It's all of us coming together for that, that public worship. And I think the book of Exodus really addresses that very well. Like I said, they came as a nation of people that had multiplied in the land of Goshen, Maybe they had lost some of their identity there because they had been put into this forced labor. They were under the authority of another person. Now they are free and now God works with them to meld them into a people. 
the journey of Exodus only takes us up to um, chapter 19 in the book. It's at chapter 19, actually, where they arrive at the base of Mount Sinai. Well, the book has 40 chapters, so you wonder what could possibly happen in the chapters that are to follow. But again, this second half of the book is where a lot of this um, liturgy develops. Again, contrary to what we've seen with Cecil B. DeMille, the story of Exodus is not just the story of Moses and Pharaoh. I mean, he does a wonderful job of developing those characters and we see them and their interaction with each other, but it's the story of a people and it's the story of a nation. And these are the descendants of those beloved sons that we've already seen, of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Exodus is a story of their special relationship with the Lord based on unique and personal experience of God for them. Moses does play a leading role as God's agent, but it's God's heart for the people that stands. I want to read what God says to Moses in Exodus 6, right after he goes to Pharaoh for the first time. He kind of begins to doubt a little bit that this is going to be quite as easy as he thought it was going to be. God said to Moses, I am the Lord. As God Almighty, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But my name, Lord, I did not make known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they were living as aliens. Now that I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are treating as slaves, I am mindful of my covenant. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord. I will free you from the forced labor of the Egyptians and will deliver you from their slavery. I will rescue you by my outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and you shall have me as my God. You will know that I, the Lord, am your God when I free you from the labor of the Egyptians and bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your own possession, I, the Lord. So we can see how clearly that relationship is established between the people and God. He states to them, you shall be my people and I will be your God. The relationship that they form is forged and sustained in ritual. Up until this time, if you look back in the books of um, the narrative from Genesis, what you'll find is that sacred places were established along the way Altars were built, but the only ritual that really had been prescribed up until that time for the people was that of circumcision. And that was a ritual that was a ratification of the covenant between the Lord and the descendants of Abraham. What we're going to see now in Exodus is that ritual and worship will begin to shape the lives of this people that are set aside by God. Uh, the commentary touched just a little bit, and I know we had some discussion in our group on the theory about who wrote the book of Exodus. Was it written by Moses himself, you know, as some believe, or was it a compilation of writing from many different sources over time? Most, most biblical scholars believe that, um, you know, many sources contributed to the writing of this book. Um, there's writings from the Eloist writers that has, has to do with that name being used for God. And these depict almost storytellers that describe God as, as very deeply connected in the life of man. And then the Yahwistic writers that describe God as more distant. Um, then there were the Deuteronomistic writers, which of course were concerned with the law. You know, we can see that all the way through the, the prescribed laws. We see that in the book of Deuteronomy especially as they go through and list those laws. That's, very, that's probably the easiest one to identify because of that. The fourth writer, though, is considered the priestly writer. And the priestly writers were concerned with the cult. And this was the establishment of ritual, the establishment of the sanctuary, temporary in the desert. Later it'll be a more permanent sanctuary, but now it will be kind of a temporary uh, and portable sanctuary for them and concerned with public worship. 
there are some people that, that feel like maybe the, the priestly writers, because the narrative of Exodus is so close to the exact narrative of how they celebrated things like the feasts of Passover, that maybe those parts were written a long time later after they had already celebrated many years and they came back and, and rewrote it to reflect that. Maybe so, maybe not. Maybe it was written exactly at the time and as it happened and it was just carried through from generation to generation. Um, from the very first request of Moses to Pharaoh, what he asks, he doesn't just say, let my people go. We're familiar with that statement. But what he says is, let them go so they can celebrate a feast to the Lord in the desert so that they can offer sacrifice, so that they can worship and come together as a people in, in ritual. This is where the beginning of ritual worship emerges. And it will come to a culmination with the celebration of the first Passover, because this is the pivotal point in that book, and of course the pivotal point in the history of the Jewish people. And an event which will be commemorated, carefully repeated throughout the generations, even to this day. We're going to have the opportunity in November um, to participate in a Seder and really get uh, an understanding of what that is like um, to participate in that. The same words that appear in this text are repeated at each Passover feast. The feast was developed as a liturgy to recall and relive the miracle of the Exodus, that passing over by the angel of death. And if you go to a Passover celebration, what you will see even now, 4,000, 5,000 years later, is that they don't say, this happened a long time ago. This happened to our ancestors. This is something we remember. They don't say that. They say we experienced this. We were brought out of slavery. They turn to their children and they say, you were brought out of slavery. Even though we know that didn't physically happen to those people, they relive it every time they celebrate that feast. We as Catholics can understand this in such a dramatic way because we come to Mass every Sunday and we experience this same thing at every Mass when the words that were spoken by Jesus at the Last Supper are repeated over the bread and wine. The, the past is brought forward to the present. It is represented and it is relived by us again. The sacrifice, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus are again present for us every time that we come and we celebrate liturgy we celebrate the Eucharist together. We can completely understand how that Passover uh, was celebrated in that way. The emphasis on ritual and public worship continues as the people come to Mount Sinai. Here again, the covenant is given to the people and it is ratified through ritual. It is ratified first through the sprinkling of blood and it is ratified through a meal with Moses, Aaron, 70 elders and God. And this is the foundation of the, Israelis, uh, the Israelites' relationship to God. And now a more formal process of worship begins as a special office of priest is established. Mandates are given for the construction of that sanctuary, the temporary one first in the, in the desert. Feasts are prescribed and ritual is defined. Much of the second part of the book of Exodus focuses on the cult of public worship. For ourselves, trying to read Exodus, not just on that literal sense, but in the spiritual sense as well, trying to see the symbolism and the allegory, it's so very clear to us that we can see our Christian life reflected in those stories of Exodus. We can see our own baptism in the passing through the waters of the Red or the Reed Sea to the other side in safety, to freedom. Um, in fact, in the liturgy of Easter Vigil, uh, this story is read again. In the blessing of the water, this story is remembered, um, that passing through the sea, passing through those waters. And of course, as I've already mentioned, we, we can see uh, that the sharing of the Paschal meal, as they came together and they, they fed on that lamb, on that uh, lamb without blemish before they passed over into the desert that nourished them for their journey, we can see that we come together for the Feast of the Eucharist. The blood on the lentils and the doorposts that saved the Egyptians 
becomes for us the blood of Jesus that we are saved through, the ultimate Paschal Lamb, the blood on the wood of the cross. Exodus truly is a work of liturgy. Finally, the last thing that I reflected on about Exodus, and it goes back to the symbolism we've already spoken about and so easy to see now, is that Exodus is a metaphor for our own freedom from bondage and our freedom from slavery. You know, it speaks in Exodus 13 of how the Israelites were led as they passed into the desert. God didn't just take them into the desert. He didn't just um, save them through the blood on the doorpost. He didn't just save them through the Red Sea, but he led them once they were in that wilderness. Exodus 13 says, The Lord preceded them in the daytime by means of a column of cloud to show them the way, and at night by means of a column of fire to give them light. Thus they could travel both day and night. Neither the column of cloud by day nor the column of fire by night ever left its place in front of the people. The last word that I turned to the dictionary to look up was the word freedom. What does it really mean to be free? Because if you look at a map and you look at where Egypt is and you look at where Cana is, they're really not that far apart. And you wonder, you can't help but wonder, why didn't God just lead them directly from one place to another? That would have been so easy. But God had a plan, just like God led them with the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. He had a plan just like he did when he called the beloved sons of Genesis. All along, God has had a plan. He led them through a southern route, a route that would eventually take them as long as 40 years to get what we think of from one place to another that would have been much easier. They grumbled and they complained. They didn't always see the way of God. Can't help but think of our own lives in that. Um, I, when I turned to the dictionary, this is what I found for the word of freedom, and it took me a while to think about it. It was different than what I expected. I thought I would see freedom as independence or, or, or freedom as something like that, but what it said was freedom is the absence of necessity, coercion, or constraint in choice or action. God didn't force the Israelite people. God doesn't force us. God gave us free will. And unfortunately, sometimes what that means is that even though he has brought us through salvation, even though he has carried us through the waters of baptism and he has nourished us at the table of the Eucharist, we still sit and grumble and complain and say, you know, I had it better back there in slavery. Why am I here in the desert? And sometimes we forget to take one footfall at a time and follow the path of God and trust in him, that moral lesson that we're supposed to learn from Exodus. I loved the very end of our, um, the very last connection question where it says, Father Neiman tells us the book of Exodus is about escape and liberation. It's also about passage and transition. Exodus is a journey of faith. It was a journey not an instantaneous change. As we discover, Israel had to encounter the Lord's great work again and again to bring them to the point of real covenant. Sometimes I wish we were people that, that got it on the first try, but unfortunately we don't. We have to fall again and again. We have to wander for a time in the wilderness of sin before we can actually come through to the land of Canaan. Um, that's the, what Exodus teaches us as a metaphor for our own path from life, from death into life, from bondage into slavery. Sometimes we look at the road ahead of us and we think it would be so much easier to return to those chains, even though we know that the path that the Lord has for us is the better one. It's almost like my journey through that train as a little girl. I could have sat in the observation deck forever. I could have enjoyed that Mount Sinai experience. I could have watched the scenery pass me by. I could have sat in quiet and calm. 
but I was challenged to move from one place to another. I was challenged to go from the safety of one car to go across that rickety, clickety clack of the tracks and that the shaking of the train and move from one car to another. So sometimes our experience is filled with those Mount Sinai experiences as well as those desert experiences of heat and no water, no electricity, no comforts that we are used to. But we trust and we're faithful and we watch one footstep at a time and we continue on that journey. We know that God takes us as well, not just the Israelite people, out of our own bondage and our slavery into freedom. The song at the very beginning uh, or that we played, I don't know if you could hear it or not, but the words said kind of had to do with water as opposed to the desert, but it's still, I think, meaningful in our journey. It said the water is, is wide. I can't get over it. I don't have the ability to swim across it. I don't have the wings to fly over it. But give me a boat that's made for two, and both of us shall row, the Lord and I. And it's in that journey that we are able to make it from point A to point B, that we are able to pass from our bondage into freedom through Jesus Christ. Why don't we go to prayer? Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you so much. All that you have brought us through in this past couple of weeks, we thank you for the safety of our families, of being with us on this journey as well. We ask that you be with us in this next few weeks as we journey through the book of Exodus, that you will help to reveal to us over time our own places of bondage and slavery and help us to step out of those and into your freedom. Help us to always trust in you and be faithful and follow you where you lead us, even if it takes us 40 years. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit.